You're back with the Hui and our political panel of experts, Professor Ella Henry. Uh, Daniel Harding is with us as well as Dr. Uh, uh, sorry, Associate Professor Lara Griggs. I'll get that right. Welcome back. Uh, let's get into it again. I wanted to get your view, though, Ahurangi, if that's OK, just picking up on our last panel point around the future of the Waitangi Tribunal. Mm. As was mentioned, Shane Jones has had a couple of cracks. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think that's really distressing because um, one of the ways that any government can negatively impact on the actions of the tribunal, and we'll see this at the budget, I hope not, but may, is cutting funding, mm. which will absolutely disempower them. And the reality is the Waitangi Tribunal is, is as close as this country will ever get to a Truth and Reconciliation mm. Commission. And, and I say that as somebody who's negotiated a settlement mm. where the real redress is the truth of our history that is agreed and shared by both mm. parties. That's what's going to be there a thousand years from now. So anything that impedes that is, I think, really fundamentally damaging our identity as a nation, not just Māori perspectives. Yeah. OK. Um, I think the interesting thing also will be, yeah, budget's going to be really interesting. We will have a budget panel. We may even get some of you back for that. So let's look forward to that as well. OK, another big piece of legislation, the Fast Track legislation. There is concern that the Fast Track Approvals Bill may breach Māori rights and interests and also have adverse impacts for hapu and iwi. Why is that? Well, anything that gives to any people in power the right to circumvent judicial and political processes that protect decision making, in other words consultation, in other words taking time, select committees, all of those processes in a vibrant democracy when you take them out of the equation and allow each other to, to jump over environmental protection, indigenous rights then you are creating a very dangerous precedent. What the government's trying to do though is it says we need to move things forward. Things move too slow in New Zealand. Infrastructure, development, we need to move the process along. That's what Chris Bissop shares, says. And not all of that is a good thing, but as I said, in a vibrant democracy, there is has got to be time for thought, research, consultation. And I think when you take that out of the equation and can leap over all of those without taking a breath, mm. then the potential for ill-conceived decision-making grows exponentially, and that is my concern, because our environment needs to have those protection mechanisms in place. Lara Nation will say they campaigned on this. People voted for them. This is what they're going to get. Yeah, and look, the sales pitch of we need to do something differently, I think that in a soundbite format, that will resonate with a lot of people. But also, I think you kind of have to follow that up with a really good rationale for why this approach will, will, be, will be safe and won't be another leaky buildings issue and won't, you know, won't cause, like, biodiversity loss long term. And that's perhaps not so well there. That Just that here's the plan for, here's the protections, here's all the different reasons. I think in government sometimes you can turn around and say we're going to do things differently mm. but you have to anticipate all of the arguments against that and have a clear plan for combating them. That's like what we would teach students and that's politics, that's debating. Yeah, DC, there's an accusation here that this is an authoritarian approach by the current government, right? Three ministers, oh there's going to be an expert panel by the way that will oversee some of these submissions and all that kind of things. But what's your perspective on that view that people say actually this is really an authoritarian approach by the government. Well, the panel is there just for the panel to be there. You know, they've, they've established it for the purpose of saying, look, we're going to take advice from, from these people. But at the end of the day, if a minister gets to make the decision, for, for me and the people that I talk to about this issue, it has the potential to be another foreshore and seabed issue. You know, the, what's going to happen when, when a, a, a company comes into to this country and wants to work on a piece of land, you know, and there's no consultation, there's no discussion, there, there's no going to the people of that land. Well, you know, we're going to see an uprising. It's interesting you say the foreshore and seabed because we are 20th anniversary, actually mm. pretty soon, of the foreshore and seabed hikui. There's been talk of other hikui going on, but do you think that's actually going to happen, that there is going to be this, this voice that starts to come out about hitting the streets? I mean, we've already seen that voice uprising, but uh, it has the potential to to grow if if something like this continues to move forward. And, and I think National and the coalition government need to consider that moving forward. Yeah, it's interesting. Jim and I is just saying on our post now on the Hui now there should be more protests. So that's interesting. Mm. Um, so, so Ahorangi, you know, the, the other argument could be here that iwi could participate in this process. In fact, iwi have participated in infrastructure development for a long time. Absolutely. So there are opportunities that exist there. There will, but it, 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 that's not necessary 
necessarily equitably distributed. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are certain iwi that have more resources mm -hmm. and more capability to engage at the highest levels. Are those we iwi, the ones that are under-resourced, underfunded, the ones often who are the last ahika of some of the most precious places, yeah. will they have a voice at the table? Yeah. I hope so. Yeah, and, and uh, one of our whanaunga, um, oh, it's Shane Jones, by the way, says mm -hmm. things like, um, if there is a mining opportunity and it's impeded by a blind frog, then goodbye, Freddie. I mean, he makes pretty clear what he wants to happen, right, mm -hmm. Lara? He's very good at the one-liners, though. Like, that's the, like, you know, <laughs> gotta give it to him. Like, that uncle energy, great, yeah. <laughs> the uncle <laughs> energy. I've never heard it described that way before. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about the three strikes law, uh, because this is gonna be re reintroduced in, in a slightly different way. Does three strikes policy work, DC? Um, it works in the sense of developing and providing excessive judgments and, and sentencing. And if that's what the government is after, which is to get people off the street for a longer period of time, then the answer is yes. But does it rehabilitate? Does it do, do the things that prison is supposed to do? I don't think so. I mean, it takes $200,000 to look after a prisoner a year. Imagine if we put that into rehabilitation for someone instead of keeping them locked up doing nothing. Yeah, what the government will say, though, is that it gives judges more discretion. Right, mm. and, and that it's only applied uh, to sentences of only two years, or 24 months. That's what the government will say as a way of measuring the kind of argument that you just made. That's true, but the government have said things like that for a long period of time, and that's why we're in where we are, uh, where we are today. Um, at the end of the day, what we have seen is evidence-based. That is, that more Māori have ended up in prison because of this. More Māori spend time longer in prison because of this law, and I think we'll see that again. What the Prime Minister said, Lara agrees, is, quote, Māori are more likely to be victims of crime crime, essentially that this policy is colourblind and will help Māori. Well, that is true, that Māori are more likely to be victims of crime. But taking this to a broad level, this is one of those areas, like one of those classic populist areas where I feel as though almost like the grand political strategy is to have us sit around and criticise it. Like me, as, a, as an associate professor, as, you know, we're a prof and all of us in this media studio, criticising it kind of almost gives the government more weight sometimes. Yep. And that's what I've honestly been having little ethical like worries at night, thinking, oh, you know, are we playing into it in a way? Because they do want to get that kind of the common sense random person that Shane Jones appeals to on the street who likes the one-liner about the frog. Mm. I, I like that too, but, you know, yep. like that likes that, but really that speaks to that person, us criticising it almost like makes it more positive in their mind. It's, it's, it's one of those weird we just got this, we're going for a populism phase team. That's what we're doing and that we're playing into it unfortunately. Professor is the part of that populist approach, the decision that the Prime Minister made to demote uh, Melissa Lee as the Minister for Broadcasting and uh, Penny Simmons as well in terms of um, Disabled People Services. I mean th these are two women ministers that the Prime Minister has decided I'm second they've gone. I think what's more interesting is to be able to take a step back and see other ministers that have perhaps acted importunely and unfortunately and have not been treated that way, whether or not it's because they're women or men, I don't know. But um, I'm more interested in the ones who've been able to get away with, I would think, inappropriate like, like behaviour. Like well, I mean, the way, say, the minister, the Associate Minister of Health and uh, the smoking advice from her ministry uh, was not really particularly chastised. Uh, High-profile um, ministers being rebuked for the way they are talking about the Waitangi Tribunal, which obviously contradicts, is any, you know... Which action. you probably can't touch because they're part of coalition Exactly, parties. but I mean, no action, no, no action at all is taken about them. Uh, so I, I'm more interested in watching, as this unravels, who's on the inside mm. and who's on the outside. And if you're on the outside, your head will get chopped off quite quickly. Man, we're getting a lot of feedback and there's so much more to discuss. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. Oh, so sorry. we're going to do it again um, in a couple of weeks, OK? Uh, thank you all very much to our professor, associate professor and also to DC. Thank you all very much for being a part of our panel tonight. Tēnā koutou.